Hello, this is the first mini lecture on Laplace transforms. This is revision of what you've learnt on previous modules, but we want to get up to speed so that we can apply them effectively to the control problems. I am Dr Peter Martin and I'm going to be teaching half this module along with Professor Costas and I'm going to take over from here Laplace transforms the next few lectures and then Costas will come back on the second half of the taught material. Okay. So you'd have seen this before, the definition of a Laplace transform, and we've given it the rigorous definition here. So first of all, Laplace transform, we write it as a curly L, and we put our function in square brackets that we're going to transform. So we've got a function f of t, which will be Laplace transformed. We can write that more succinctly as our function f of s with a bar over the top of it. So we've gone from a space t to a space s that we're working in. So the definition has an integral with limits epsilon tending to zero from the positive side and t tending to infinity. So the limit from epsilon to t. Uh, our function f of t and then we create the Laplace transform by multiplying our function with e to the minus st dt. Now you've probably seen that in its more simple form where we just put our limits in as naught to infinity. That's okay a lot of the time, but there are a few instances where you'll find that we have to be careful at these limits to make sure we define the function correctly. For example, if there are discontinuities. Okay, what does it mean to do a transform? This is familiar to you. It's a graph of time showing our function as it changes over time. Now this function could be the input to a system or it could be the output of a system. So in control in particular, we want to characterize how does the output respond to the different inputs that are taking place. So we've transformed it. So we've got some space S now and we've got our Laplace transformed function F bar S. What does that actually mean? What does it mean and why do we do it? First thing to note, S is a complex number. So S is something like sigma plus I omega. It has a real part and it has an imaginary part. And that gives us a lot of capability. So when we have our term e to the minus st, we can capture the frequency response of a system or an input with e to the minus omega t and we can capture the decay effects with e to the minus sigma t. What do we mean by that? Well you remember that e to the minus i omega t, exponential of the imaginary of an imaginary term, that can be used to represent sinusoidal functions. e to the minus sigma t, that's a real number, and so that's going to represent some transient decay type function. This is really useful for us. Any problem that we want to look at, it was likely to have both frequency elements and it's likely to have longer, more transient effects in the response and in the types of signals that are coming in or out of the system. So the Laplace transform has got the tools within it to analyze both aspects of that. So we can transform to time to S if we want to go backwards, we would be looking at something like this. We can write the inverse Laplace transform with L to the minus one. That takes us back to F of T. And this integral would do that for us. But what does this mean? And what do these limits mean? Well, you're not going to have to use that. It's more convenient to decompose your Laplace transform into known functions and use a table to do the inversion. And we're going to look at some techniques for doing that in a later mini lecture. Are there any, any limitations on when we can use the Laplace transform? We want to think about this and check that it will always work. This is the definition we have, integrating from naught to infinity. And the one condition we need to be sure that we're keeping is that our integral must be a finite value and it must be bounded, or i.e. it must be bounded. So that means we can't have an integral that is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as t goes to infinity. 
it needs to come down to a finite value. So we can illustrate what this means with a simple example. f of t equals e to the at, where a is greater than zero, it's a positive number. We want to find the Laplace transform of that. To find the Laplace transform, we have our curly L of our function. Okay, so that means we need to put our function into the integral and conduct that integration. So we can do e to the minus e to the a minus s t. We want to integrate it. But what happens when we do that? Okay, so let's consider the case. A minus s is greater than zero. A minus s, if that's greater than zero, we've got an exponential term with a positive exponent. And so as we integrate this tending towards infinity for time, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So this will be unbounded. We can't find the Laplace transform for that function. We can only find the Laplace transform if s is greater than a. So if s is greater than a, that means that term is negative. And as we tend to infinity, the term will tend to zero and that gives us a bounded answer. Happily, this doesn't happen very often. And in our course, we're only going to deal with cases where the Laplace transform exists. So you know that there are limitations on it, but we're not going to have to be checking for those all the time. Okay, so we've seen a couple of reasons why we would use the Laplace transform. Uh, first of all, we know that it's a good way of solving differential equations, first order differential equations. And so that's likely to be useful for control problems where things are changing with time and we want to work out how something responds to a given input. We've just seen that they have the imaginary and real part so that they're able to deal with both transient effects and frequency responses. And a third reason why they're really effective is that they are a linear operation. So a linear operation means this. If we have a function that we want to take the Laplace transform of, where our function involves a sum of two different things, and it involves the product of our function with uh, a constant, it means that we can separate all of this out very neatly. So the sum just becomes two sums, and the constants can be taken outside of the Laplace transform. So we can simplify and we can manipulate Laplace transforms very easily. We want to be confident in our understanding of why these things are true and to be able to derive them ourselves. So we're going to show a proof for all of the examples we look at. So that's what we want to do the Laplace transform of. In all of these proofs, we just input the function into the Laplace transform and work our way through the integration. So we've put it in there. We can then apply the rules of integration. We can separate the two parts into two integrations. And then we can take out our constants so that we're just integrating our function multiplied by e to the minus st. And then you will recognize straight away that this term here is the Laplace transform for f1t. Likewise, this is the Laplace transform for f2t. So we can write that in and then we get the result we were looking for. That this is a linear function where you can separate out addition and take out constants outside the Laplace transform. Good. So we've done that. We've seen how it works, we've seen the definition, we've talked about why you would want to use it, why we want to understand it. So we need to then look at the common examples that we will encounter in control. So in this mini lecture we're going to look at some initial examples and in the next mini lecture we're going to look through some more examples too and get familiar with what they are, what types of function you get for the Laplace transforms and how you can calculate them yourself. So first of all we're going to start again with an exponential function e to the minus at, uh, and this is for t greater than or equal to zero. You'll notice that in all of this module, we're going to be doing this. We're going to be defining our function, but being careful to define the region of time or the region of space at which that function is uh, defined for. Uh, and that's because sometimes we're going to encounter discontinuities where the function changes from one form to another. And so we need to be clear about the regions it's applicable to. Okay, as we've done before, we input our function into the definition of the Laplace transform. We can manipulate that and then perform the integration. So we integrate that, and so the minus s plus a goes down to the bottom. This function then stays the same, 
and our limits are naught to infinity. And whilst we have lots of exponential terms, these tend to disappear when we apply the limit. So e to the minus s plus a infinity is going to be zero because we've got the negative term. e to the minus s plus a times zero is going to be one because it's e to the power zero. And that then simplifies out our Laplace transform. So the exponential term in time becomes one over s plus a. That's very simple. And likewise, if we wanted to consider e to the a t, then we can just substitute our a for minus a, and we get another expression there for the Laplace transform. This one's called the ramp function. So now we're looking at things that typically might be inputs to a system. So you have your chemical process and you have all sorts of different inputs which are affecting what's happening, how it's behaving. And so this could be a signal or a, uh, an input which is increasing steadily with time. For example, it could be a tank filling up which is then affecting something else in the process. So our function f of t varies with time and it's a linear increase. Obviously we can write an equation for that, f of t equals at where a is the gradient, and this is true for t is greater than or equal to zero, a is a constant. We follow the same routine. The Laplace transform involves us inputting the, substituting in our function into the definition and performing the integration. This integration requires us to use the integration by parts. We've got this part here and we've got this part here. So you can see how we've separated those out. And then we can work through our integration. And we get another simple expression for the Laplace transform A over S squared. So we're seeing that all of our functions that we're interested in seem to be turned into nice and simple functions when they are Laplace transforms. We said that we can deal with frequency type responses, sinusoidal signals, and so we'll take an example of that. Our function f of t is sine omega t. Again, this could be a signal coming into a system, something that's fluctuating. We go through the same process, we substitute this in to the definition. What do we do now? sine and an exponential. How do we deal with that? Well, we've got to remember this is a complex S. So let's put our sine function into its exponential form. So this is using Euler's rule, Euler's formula. And if you're not familiar with that, or if you've forgotten that, have a look at it, look it up. And you'll refresh your memory that uh, a sine function can be expressed as e to the j omega t minus e to the minus j omega t divided by 2j. So this is expressing a sinusoidal function in the complex plane. Multiplied by e to the minus st, and of course now you can see how to work your way through this integration. Multiply through by the e to the minus st. Perform the integration, apply the limits, and then simplify our final expression. 1 over s minus j omega minus 1 over s plus j omega. So we want to multiply these together and simplify that, which gives us omega squared over s squared plus omega squared. Very simple, very similar to the other Laplace transforms we've got. And we can start to see how all these expressions are looking manageable and convenient. Similarly, we go through the same process for a cos function and we'd find that that is s over s squared plus omega squared. So we're getting nice functions for all of these useful inputs. The last one that we'll do in this mini lecture is the step function. Again, this is representing something that you might find in a process. We have our function, it stays constant and zero until time t when it suddenly increases to a value a and then is constant again. So that represents things that could happen on a process. 
um, a sudden change in an input, a valve being opened, for example, could be represented with this function. Now it has a discontinuity, so we have to bring in this definition of the time periods carefully. So now f of t is equal to a when t is greater than zero, and f of t is zero when t is less than zero. And we note that on the line t equals zero, the function is undefined. It's neither here nor here, it's undefined. And so this is an example of where we need to just take care with the limits of the integration. So we've substituted in, we need to substitute in our function into the definition, and now we need to look at our limits just to make sure we apply them correctly. So t tends to infinity, that's okay. We can treat that as infinity. Epsilon tends to zero from the positive side. So what's our function at t equals zero? Well, we're approaching it from this side, and so the function is going to be equal to a when we reach this limit. So it tells us uh, which uh, side of the function to look at for that point. So we substitute that in from zero to infinity, substituting in our function a, and we can then perform that simple integration and we get a step function is equal to a over s, where a was the height of the step function. Okay, thanks for listening to this section. The next mini lecture is going to look through some more functions and then after that we will start to look at how to manipulate Laplace transforms so that we can convert them back into the time domain.